the talks this morning in the opening plenary were, were just very inspirational. People laid out a terrific vision of adaptation, where we're going, why we need to do this. There's often a real disconnect, though, between this vision and what actually happens at the project and the program level. And I'm going to go through an example and, and talk about some of the constraints with looking at everything as adaptation. Here's some of the attributes of good adaptation. There's a whole long list. I'm just going to go through a couple of these. Almost everything you read on adaptation says, boy, as long as we adapt to current climate variability, we're going to be adapted to climate change. We need to mainstream all that we're doing into the sectors, focus on low regrets options, align adaptation to sustainable development, cost efficient, cost effective, equitable. There's a long list. But if we do these, is this enough for a particular project or program to be adaptation? I didn't know what Tony was going to talk about, so the talks are really well connected. I'm going to take on heat wave early warning systems. We know that temperatures have changed. We know that heat waves have become more frequent, more intense, have greater spatial extent. And we do know that there is attribution of this change to changing greenhouse gas emissions. As Tony mentioned, there's a whole lot of work that's gone on about managing the risks of heat waves. There's been very large heat waves. He mentioned the one in Europe. Across the heat waves that occurred in Europe in 2003, there were 70,000 excess deaths. You can see on the left a series of risk factors. There's even more risk factors that are known for who is vulnerable. During a heat wave, there's a long list of adaptation options. One of them is early warning systems. Quite a number of cities have put together early warning systems. This happens to be a quite comprehensive plan that was put together in London. It has different levels. The different levels are defined based on the local context. So different communities are building on different experiences to define how you set up a response plan. And on the right, you see that the temperature thresholds are different in different cities across the UK based on their particular context, on their urban heat island, on the adaptation, acclimatization of the population. And we do know that early warning systems save lives. There's not that many evaluations of these systems. But as you look at the systems as a whole, we know that they can save lives. So these systems are good. They are saving lives. There's a tremendous adaptation deficit. No one ever needs to die in a heat wave. But are they adaptation to climate change? They are addressing the current adaptation deficit. They're mainstreamed. People are talking about challenges of mainstreaming. This is a great example of something that's very well mainstreamed. These are pretty much owned by some kind of met services at the local level with whatever the health community, health department is at the local level. They're very low regrets. Heat waves are going to continue to occur in a changing climate. No matter the magnitude and extent of climate change, we know they save lives. We actually know that they're relatively inexpensive to put together. So these are all well and good. But there's a whole long list of challenges around climate change that these systems haven't taken on. These are, this is just an example from the US, this is temperatures in March of, two, of this year. So these are deviations from normal. And of course, it's in degree Fahrenheit because why would the US go to centigrade? Um, and so you can see if there's a pointer on this. Look, there you go. This is eight or nine degrees above normal. Heat wave early warning systems define a summer period. And the summer period in the Northern Hemisphere is from mid-May until mid-September. This was in March. In Europe, one of the cities that has a heat wave early warning system, there was a quite a large heat wave last September, at the end of September, after the system had shut down. The systems are not designed to think about how changing temperatures are going to affect their operability. Projections for what the temperatures are going to look like in the future are not reassuring. For those of you who haven't seen this, this comes from the IPCC special report 
on managing the risks of extreme events and disasters to advance climate change adaptation. I can bet you can guess that's a negotiated title. And um, what happened in this is there was very strong interactions between working groups one and two to produce the report. For the chapter that came from working group one, the climate scientists analyzed temperatures in 26 world regions. And so you can see Australia down here, there's two regions in Australia. And they looked at the historic record, they determined the temperature, the maximum temperature that occurs once every 20 years. So it's a 20 year return period. And then over here, you can see using three different scenarios for mid-century and for end of the century, said how often would that temperature occur. And if you look here, you're talking mid-century in Western Australia, somewhere between three and five years. By the end of the century, you're talking probably every other year. Very big change over a very short period of time. But heat wave early warning systems are not designed to take this into account. Thresholds of, and I'm not speaking for all of them, I haven't really looked at the ones here in Australia, but the ones that I know in the US and several other cities have established a threshold, they've established a response plan, and they're chugging along, they're saving lives, they're doing good things, but they're not really adaptation to climate change. And I think that matters. I think it matters if everything is adaptation to climate change, then if everything's in, nothing's out. It matters because there's something, not in the health sector, but certainly in water resources, um, called the levee effect, where people think if you build a bigger levee, they're gonna be safe. We're putting in systems that is giving the population the impression that they're adapted to changing temperatures when they're really focusing on dealing with current climate variability. People are getting false impressions of how well they're prepared. It also matters because the reality of political constraints is there is funding for adaptation. It is separate from funding for development. There's many who would argue that's wrong, and I would certainly be with you that there needs to be better integration of these. But in a world where there is limited resources, if we're not using the sources to adapt to climate change, then we're denying the opportunity for other activities that would be adaptive to climate change. So thinking about how to take an early warning system and turn it into something that is adaptive to climate change, there's a whole series of questions. And these are just some of them that can come up. I'm sure you can create a much longer list than this of looking at thresholds. How do we think about changing thresholds over time? We know that current temperature where mortality starts to increase with increasing temperatures. What is that gonna look like in the future? How do we make that decision? Particularly, how do we make that decision if we already have an early warning system in place, which is reducing morbidity and mortality, hopefully to a very large extent? It's not gonna be easy to figure out how to answer these questions, but they're not being posed by the people who are working on these programs. What do you do when you have these really massive excursions from normal experience. We've seen that several times over the last few years. The early warning systems are really based on historic experience. They often don't go into the what if realm. How are we gonna monitor acclimatization? How are we gonna monitor all the other kinds of drivers that determine the vulnerability to heat waves? And it's not just the health sector, I'm, I'm taking on the health sector, but um, certainly water resources and other sectors have the same issue. So if you, I don't know if you can read in the bottom, on the bottom left it says Mother Nature, the bottom right it says Human Nature, flooded city hall says if we just build bigger levees, we'll be fine next time. There's an awful lot of that going on. And again, I think there needs to be much more rigorous thinking about what is adaptation to climate change and what is trying to put our communities in a better situation. It's not that these are wrong, it's just that they're not enough. When thinking about what the possible risks are of climate change, the special report on extreme events spent a long time thinking about how to characterize risk and how to define the components that go into risk. As you can see from this, there's three main factors that go into determining risk. 
In this case, it's disaster risk, but it applies across certainly most of the sectors that I know of. You've got the weather and climate events themselves. As Tony articulated very well, the extent to which those will arise in the future depends on how much and how fast we mitigate. There is the exposure, who or what is exposed to that. We heard a lot this morning about land use planning, about people moving into harm's way, how decisions are taken about moving people into harm's way, how you move people out of harm's way, and their vulnerability. If adaptation is a risk management issue, then adaptation should be focusing on at least most of these components. That adaptation should be taking into consideration how each of these then create risk. And from that risk, the impacts will arise, and how can we prevent those impacts by addressing the underlying issues? There's lots of versions of iterative risk management out there. This is just one of the ones that is often used. Adaptation needs to have some component of iterativeness to it. It needs to acknowledge that risks are changing over time and needs to think very much about how to manage that change over time. It's not that we're going to get it right the first time. There's absolutely no chance that we will get it right the first time. But there has to be a thought about how to make that happen. And in thinking about this, when I was putting this together, I realized that the iterativeness is very important, but another part is intention. That we need to have an intention to adapt to climate change. We know that intention is not enough. Uh, we all know the problems with intentions. When I was putting this together, I was thinking, I know Will's in the audience somewhere, and Will, I actually will get that review to you any day now. Um, my <laughs> I really will get that review to you. But we do know that there's real challenges with intention, but there needs to at least be the expression of intention. So as we go from a world that today is not adapted to some future world that is adapted, it's a description of where are we going and how are we moving across this space that we're not just staying in the current space and making today adapted, but we're thinking about how a future world would look to be adapted. I think the cartoonist Harris gets many things right in science. So starting this equation, here's today, here's an adapted future. In the middle, it says, then a miracle occurs. And the caption says, I think you should be more explicit in the second step. So thanks to Otmar Edenhofer. Um, I stole some of this from something he presented two weeks ago. Adaptation is its an inspirational goal. We don't know what an adapted society is going to look like, because we don't know what a future world is going to look like. We don't know what that world is going to think adaptation looks like. We're not going to know what their risk aversion is. We're not going to really know today what their technologies are going to be. There's a whole range of issues that we don't know about. But from today, looking forward and thinking about the uh, wonderful talks this morning from the recent graduates, the students, on we have to look to the future and where do we think we're trying to go. And we also have to s describe some kind of process for getting there. So I thought that was all really great. And then I was thinking, these are really nice pathways, which led me to thinking about how people think the process of adaptation is some kind of great activity where you sit down with a group of stakeholders, you decide on a goal, you work out how you're going to do it, and you sit down and you make it happen. And so there's this real wonderful focus on how things should work in a perfect world. And none of my projects have ever looked like this. Mine look more like this. <laughs> But, but, but all the talks talk really about the former. Um, and so really, how we get there is much more going to look like this. But we need to really try. And the point I'm trying to make is that as scientists who work on adaptation, we need to be more rigorous in our thinking about what is adaptation and think about what our intentions are, lay out some kind of process, knowing that process is going to be adjusted continually as we go forward and doing the best we can in these kinds of approaches, we're going to be putting society on a better foot going forward. Thank you.
And again, time for a quick question. It's difficult to see. Ah, right over Maybe yonder. I think we've got microphone two coming. Is that the? Uh... That's what it looks like. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is John Rainbird from Torres Strait Regional Authority. I guess the question is one that um, pops up a fair bit, but it's around looking at this issue just through a climate lens, and. <clears throat> I guess, um, having looked at some of these strategies, they don't seem to factor in other drivers that are happening out there, and the pitfalls of only looking through it through a climate lens. Do you have a comment on that? You're absolutely right. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to show that framework that was used in the special report on extreme events, that saying risk is the confluence of three different factors and focusing just on the weather and climate event is insufficient. That we do know there's significant vulnerabilities and it does not take a large event to have very significant impacts. And so there does need to be a very strong focus on the vulnerability and on the exposure. And different projects and programs will focus on different aspects of that, but without laying, again, without laying out the intention of where this is supposed to be going, I don't see that it can be adaptive if you start either with vulnerability or with climate change. There's somebody else that's got a hand up. Um, Charming one from CSL uh, Climate Adaptation Flagship. Um, just trying to seek your um, view, particularly related to the um, morning session regarding the Australia reform, which put a high priority on the current climate risk rather than a low priority on the future climate risk. So I'm just trying to seek, you, seek your view. What do you think about this sort of approach? As I've said, focusing on risk can be very valuable and we do know that there's a lot of approaches to address risk that are very beneficial. I'm trying to make some division between just focusing on current risk and thinking about what it means in a climate change context. All of you are experts in this area. You can all think of examples where actions taken today are not gonna be adaptive in the future. And there are real challenges with providing some kind of assurance to people that focusing on reducing that current risk means that they're gonna be better adapted. I use the example of the heat waves. I think we're creating a problem with communities thinking they're being adapted to heat waves and when you look at the projections for these changes in temperatures without having the institutions, the governance, the, the plan in place for how to make adjustments is going to be challenging. From a public health perspective, we've got long experience with setting up programs that you don't adjust over time. Something surprises you, you have high morbidity and mortality, and the population tends to get pretty unhappy when that happens, as they should be. And that we've got a responsibility to help keep that short and that long-term perspective of saying the short term is, is good or it's not good or it's kind of good if you did it better this way. And in the long-term perspective, you may be going in this direction, but in the end, you've gotta be going over here. And so we need to help communicate both of those perspectives so that the overall process is working towards adaptation.